Good morning. We are live from Shop Talk. I am with Jason Grunberg, the general manager of Sale Through. Uh, my name is Ken Fenyo. I am the president of research and advisory at Corsite Research. And uh, we are going to be talking about personalization and a number of other things. Uh, Sale Through is a leading provider of one to one personalization and cross channel marketing automation software. And uh, very happy to have you, Jason. Thanks Thank for you. joining yeah. us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back here. Uh, on the Las Vegas floor at Shop Talk and uh, talking about personalization. It's great to be back and live, uh, live on here and live in person. Um, Jason, why don't we start talking about you guys have created the Retail Personalization Index. I know you've been doing it for a few years. You're launching the new version uh, coming out on Wednesday. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about the RPI? How did you come about and, and what is it hoping to measure? Yeah, certainly. So um, as you already said, Sail Through is kind of a pioneer in personalization ever since we were founded. We've been built on the notion that one-to-one -one connections and a dynamic experience is important, uh, a really important part of the customer experience. And with that, we were constantly in conversation with our customers and just the market at large. And the questions that we would always get were really simple. What should we be doing? Where should we be focused in the next 12 or 24 months? And who else is doing this really well? Um, most retail organizations and brands obviously comp against like their direct competitors. They're looking at what's going on in the market right around them, but they're not necessarily looking in other places to say, oh, that's a source of inspiration. That's certainly things that you get like here at Shop Talk when you go to the various tracks mm -hmm. and see the brand speak. But we really wanted to be able to provide our customers in the market at large with research that helped them understand where things are going, where things are, so that you might already be behind a little bit, and who's really leading the pack. So the personalization index itself is a ranking of 100 retail organizations and brands based on how well they connect and personalize the customer experience across key digital and offline channels. To get to that ranking of 100, this year, we evaluated 500 organizations. So it's our fifth year. Um, we thought we'd up the ante from about the 250 that we had looked at last time. So 500 organizations, and we partnered with Foresight mm -hmm. to execute on consumer research, uh, a survey of marketers, a deep dive into data privacy. And if all of that comes together for us to figure out a custom scoring matrix every year, that changes based on consumer sentiment. We're our consumers feel personalization is impactful. Um, and the retailer survey this year was really incredible for adding additional context into um, what, what consumers are saying. Well, and I think what's great about this survey, uh, at the survey, but the RPI in general, is that it's based, it is based on the consumer. So it's what they find important in terms of their experience and the personalization, which I think adds a, it's just not you guys figuring out who's doing a good or bad job. It's really consumer driven. But why don't we talk a bit about, uh, about the brands in it? And, yeah. and now you've done it a long time. I'm sure some brands have, have risen to the top, kind of consistently do well. Uh, tell us a little bit maybe who those are and, and what is it that they do well that keeps them at the top? Yeah, certainly. So we can't have this conversation without talking about Sephora. So Sephora has ranked number one uh, for the first four years of the index. And um, because the research is launching in two days, I'm not going to give away uh, where they ended up, but they did fare very well once again. And uh, one of the reasons for that really is their um, consistent use of data across the customer experience. And that's a really simplistic kind of statement. But at the core, what we find really interesting is how Sephora uses loyalty as an experience that really binds you know, all touch points together. So um, their loyalty program, you use it, they use it to connect email, web, mobile, and even the in-store experience. And one of the things that I've always appreciated about Sephora and their approach is they experiment really in this interesting intersection of where, what makes their brand unique and their buyer unique. And that's something that from the early days where they stood apart and other top performers have as well. And what I mean by that is that when you think about Sephora, walking into a Sephora or going to their website could be an overwhelming experience. Mm -hmm. The sheer size of the product catalog is absolutely massive. And what they know about their buyer is that that buyer isn't just using the same products day in and day out. They're responsive to trend. They are responsive to different seasons. Um, there's so much in the world outside of a Sephora buyer and a Sephora loyalist that might drive you know, the products that they're looking to change and discover. And so Sephora thinks about that in terms of how they end up building personalization modules. So you even think about the augmented reality app that was launched years ago. Really interesting use of kind of value exchange for the consumer to provide more data to Sephora and Sephora to provide 
a really excellent experience you know, in, in exchange for that. Um, this year, again, their loyalty program really helped them uh, stay close to the top of the index. And something else I think we're impressed by and consumers are as well, is that Sephora has really been innovating in terms of how they can connect that buyer to products. Mm-hmm. A lot has changed in the last two years, and we've seen Sephora come out with some really exciting announcements in terms of their partnerships for um, really quick fulfillment in major cities. Now there are you know, partnerships with other retailers where you can buy Sephora product in other stores. Uh, really, really interesting in terms of their approach. Yeah, I mean, I will say that from the research, one thing we saw uh, is that consumers don't just think personalization as one thing, yep. right? It's really every cross everything. So it is marketing, sure, right? It's do I get an offer that's relevant, but it's fulfillment we saw as one thing that they want more personalized, right? Uh, what product selection there is. Uh, so really everything about the experience, uh, consumers really want it to be more personalized, which I think is interesting. I think Sephora is a great example too of, of a brand that goes really beyond just an earn and earn kind of program, Fair right? Much. So the loyalty there is much more about you know, how do I how do I create experiences that are unique? I'm going to give you a product, a sample that you're going to love, right? You're going to have an exclusive event or a tutorial or whatever it is. It's, it's a lot of people don't think beyond just, hey, you, you buy, I'm going to give you back some money. Uh, it's not bad. That works fine. But it really misses a lot of the opportunity to, to do more with those products. Yeah, and you get the sense as a Sephora customer that those samples that they're providing you are somehow founded in data, right? They feel close in to what you're buying or as you shop with some of their competitors and it feels kind of like a grab bag, right? In some scenarios. And so um, we we think it is that like, consistent use of data and at least that feeling as a buyer that you are getting value exchange for the data that you're providing that, that continues to set them up. And that's really that value exchange is one of the big findings we found in the research, yes. which was consumers are protective of their data, but they're willing to give it to the retailer brand if they get something back in exchange. So that it, retailers really need to think about that. Uh, it's not a one, one way exchange. It's, it's gotta be two way, I think in terms of how they do it. Why don't we move on and let's talk about, we talked about Sephora, which has always been at the top. Yep. Any brands, did you see make a big move this year, like really just jumped up and, and again, kind of what, what drove that? Yeah, thing? two brands um, come to mind on that. First is First Dibs and second is DSW. Um, so when it comes to First Dibs, they actually were, I believe, outside of the top 100 last year and they were the fastest mover this year. And so they're well inside of the top 100 um, and a little spoiler alert, like, they're definitely in the top quartile of performers this year. And what we found really interesting about their approach is the combination of content and commerce. And when I say we found it interesting, certainly consumers did as well, because that's you know where the rankings do come from, as you said. But the way that First Dibs combines at the category level, the content they're producing with where the, the categories that somebody might be interested in is really seamless. Um, you know that as a you know furniture shopper that you're not necessarily buying a couch every week. You're not buying chairs every other week. These are high ticket items. And what I think First Dibs, where First Dibs can serve as inspiration for other organizations that have higher price points is to look at how they're using content and commerce to kind of nurture that buyer as they're going through the process, whether it's in abandonment tactics or other areas of the customer experience. Um, a similar organization, Food 52, um, which is, I believe, outside of the top 100 this year, but absolutely a standout in terms of their approach to content and commerce, and two brands that we think everybody should be paying attention to. On the DSW side, um, DSW is actually kind of already in the future uh, when it comes to the trends that they're paying attention to. So we look at, you know, what's become table states in any given year that we're tracking these trends over time. We believe that uh, DSW is actually going to already, is already set to perform really well in the next version of the index. Uh, What stood out to us is their loyalty program and how that's kind of kind of spread across. Also their use of SMS, um, they're kind of an early adopter in that space. And one of the things that we thought was interesting was 54% of organizations in the top 100 are using SMS already. These would be 31% of all organizations mm. that are using it. So you can already see that becoming maybe a table state into next year. And it's interesting, we did see in the survey, it was kind of interesting that consumers like email and SMS, right? They think it's a good channel for personalization, really much more than we saw the brands and retailers yeah. like it, right? They, they sort of, Maybe it already moved on, but for consumers, it was still really relevant for them. Um, but let's talk a bit about that table stake idea. I'm curious, you know, what what do we think this year is going to be 
on trend, but maybe next year will be will be table stakes. Like, what are some of the next things you see? Yeah. So to your point, right? Consumers are really interested in personalization of the site and the email experience. Whereas marketers and retailers are focused on social and other channels. Um, and our recommendation is to revisit the site and the email experience because there's so much more that can and really needs to be done. What we see becoming table stakes into the next year is that very evident use of an individual consumer staff. So post logging in, having the site experience be really dynamic for me as a buyer. So if I'm going to support a site, I want to really see that curation happening post that login experience, which I think is an important step because you want to incentivize your buyers to be logging in. Mm -hmm. um, that is giving you a really cleaner data capture from the zero and first party perspective, which is becoming you know, really important for most organizations, whether you're direct to consumer or multi-channel or really pure play on the wholesale side. And so um, it's that site experience, having it be dynamic, but then also that clear connectivity into email and having email be kind of a hub for the total experience. We used to think of mobile as really being the hub. And I think increasingly what we see top reformers doing is treating email as that hub because email is that channel that actually connects mobile, connects uh, to right. the site and can connect to in-store. And not everybody has a native app or needs to. And so that's where SMS is really coming into play uh, as something that's going to become table stakes in the next year. Yeah, no, that's great. Those are great points. Yeah, and I think it's, it's being willing to innovate a bit, but not leave behind the things that work, right? Yeah. So that always, it's always interesting, too, is that balance of, of how do you make sure you're giving a great experience and personalized? Because the problem is, is if it's not personalized, people just turn it off, yep. right? They'll, they'll tell you to stop emailing me, stop, stop sending me SMS. So I think that getting in the personalization is really a big driver. And, it, and it's really not... It, Nobody should be treating it as a set it and forget it type, you know, tactic. Personalization is something that needs to evolve over time. And so going back to the areas of your site or an email where you have spent time and energy, but maybe that was three years ago and revisiting that. And that's something that we actually see Sephora do quite often. Uh, quite frankly, is that they'll go back and look at their entire triggers program and reevaluate how are they triggering? What are they triggering off of? What is the content that they're using within that? Uh, we see other organizations, uh, Textile Fashion Group does something very similar. Um, other sales group customers, we're constantly encouraging them to do, do that as well. Uh, a brand, for example, that we love is Repzilla, again, just outside of the top 100 this year, but I think they have something like 120 uh, different triggered flows just in email. Um, that are responsive to specific brands that a consumer might land on and abandon. Uh, they are partnering with their merchants that way uh, to develop these really specific streams that are then personalized. They're also kind of breaking that like fourth wall of personalization of saying, hey, do you want better email? Well, like here's the way to do that. Fill out this profile, give us more so that we can give you more. That's an interesting approach, being more upfront about yeah. it. Like, why, why make it a game? We know you're, we're getting your data, but here's how we're going to use it. Exactly. That would probably resonate. I mean, just fit into that idea of value exchange, right? People are willing to give you data if they know what it's going to be used for. Why not be transparent about it? Right? Yeah. I think day and, and, age. and that's one of the things that we feel sets this year apart. So, you know, you know we've been doing the index since 2017, right? And so the first year was really foundational. The, the folks that stood apart, they were just doing some, somewhat basics when it came to personalization. The second and third years really became about consistent messaging and a focus on triggers. So having that personalization of the journey being responsive or reactive. Then over the last two or three years, we kind of entered into this age of real proactivity when it comes to personalization. So real clear use of that data. This year, it really is kind of the rise of or the confluence of data privacy regulation, changes that we know are coming from our ability to collect and use data as brands, and consumers really wanting to be in the driver's seat of that experience. And retailers that are thinking about that and trying to get ahead of the curve and almost shift into this idea of proactivity versus being reactive, those are the ones that are really standing apart and we think have the right foundation for setting up the future. That's great. 
Well, I want to thank you. I think we're about out of time. This has been a great conversation. Uh, thanks to the audience for, for tuning in. Uh, I know that the new RPI is coming out Wednesday. I don't know if there's an easy way for people to uh, access it or what, or any news yeah, sure. on where to thank figure you. out where you stand if you're a retailer or a brand. Yeah, you can go to sellthrough100.com, access the research. Uh, last year's research search should be up there right now about Wednesday morning. That's going to flip to the 2022 version. You'll be able to see the top 100, explore the 400 other brands that were evaluated in didn't quite make it into the top 100. There's the foresight research report that we worked on together, a host of other assets available. Um, we welcome you to explore. We do custom competitive analysis for organizations that are interested and always happy to chat about personalization anytime. Awesome. Well, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Great. Dan. Thanks. Have a great rest of the show. Thanks, everyone. Take care.